Steve here is the show where I answer your questions and this week my first question comes from in Gerward Shirase. In your experience, Steve, which is worse, Trump apologists or religious apologists? Or do you find them to be equally mendacious and frustrating? Which do you think might come to their senses first? Trump apologists are the worst and they are also the ones who will probably come to their senses first because while Jesus ain't coming back anytime soon, Sooner or later, Trump is going down. Hopefully sooner. Hopefully before he starts a nuclear war with North Korea. The, in principle, they're the same because they're both defending indefensible things. They're both staking out these untenable positions and saying, this is the way it is and nobody can change my mind. But in practice, I think Trump apologists are way worse because they're defending and enabling a man who is incredibly dangerous and, and in the position where he can do a great deal of harm, an almost unimaginable amount of harm, both to the United States and to the entire world right now. I don't fear for the future of my civilization because of religious apologists, whereas uh, the threat of the Trump administration and the people who continue to apologize for him and make excuses for him and cheer him on at this point, that really scares me. Uh, that, that makes me fear for the future of my civilization, of our civilization. So uh, yeah, I would say the Trump apologists in practice are way worse. Skull bearer. Hey Steve, I don't know much about US politics, but I am very worried about Trump. It looks like he might not last much longer, which is good, but I am worried if he could do something to enact martial law in the US or declare war on someone. Could he do that? Are you worried about this too? I'm not worried about the martial law thing. There really is no historical precedent for a president declaring martial law on the entire nation. Uh, during the Civil War, Abraham Lincoln declared martial law in a few places and deployed troops to sort of maintain order in some places and, you know, did some things that were very constitutionally questionable, like uh, suspending habeas corpus for a time and, and that sort of thing. Um, but other than that, which took place during the Civil War, a completely unprecedented circumstance, uh, there really is no precedent and no mechanism for a president to just unilaterally declare martial law. So I'm not as worried about that. I mean, who knows, Trump might try something like that because he's a doofus who doesn't know anything about his job or his authority and he might just declare it, but I don't know if it would mean anything. Um, but as far as starting a war, yeah, I'm very worried about that, especially in the last couple of days. I mean, I'm not an alarmist about it. I don't, I don't find myself looking up at the sky for North Korean missiles or anything like that. Like, I don't feel like it's imminent but is it more of a threat than it has been in any other period in my lifetime? Yeah. And is that because of Trump? Yeah. Yeah, so I'm, I'm very worried about that, absolutely. Thomas Swords, Steve, I'm a big fan of yours and largely agree with you on all things political. However, you have some interests that I do not share. The one that really jumps out at me is pro wrestling. I don't mean this to be insulting, but I stopped finding that compelling at about age 12. Now that I can't help but think of Donald Trump's involvement when I consider the sport, I have to ask, why do you like it? It's hard to describe what I like about it. The best I can tell you is, despite all of the reasons to be embarrassed, despite all of the shortcomings, despite all of the flaws and the sins that have been committed by wrestlers and wrestling companies over the years, when a pro wrestling match is worked by people who know what they're doing, by really talented wrestlers, who know how to tell a story using a wrestling match and they're telling a compelling story and there's good psychology and everything that happens in the match makes sense and it's dramatic and it pulls me to the edge of my seat so I don't know what's going to happen and I have a rooting interest. I want one wrestler more than the other to win. It makes me suspend my disbelief so I forget for the duration of that match that it's a performance and that it's all been predetermined and I'm just hoping for the outcome that I want. Uh, it's one of the most thrilling things in the world to me. Obviously not to you, obviously not to a lot of people, and that's completely fine. I don't think that everybody has to like it. I certainly get why it's not everybody's cup of tea. I certainly get why, why it's considered a very low art form. 
Uh, it ought to be. It is. It's, it's a, a very populist, very low form of theater. It's not high art. It never has been. It never will be. It, it's it's a, a slightly elevated form of, of like a carnival performance. Um, and it is what it is. And when it's done really well by people who are really good at it, um, it's it's just one of my favorite things. It's one of the most exciting things in the world to me. Uh, and like I say, it's difficult to describe why that is other than I appreciate the art form and I appreciate when it is executed well. Francois Lecombe, hello Steve. Sooner or later, barring some planet-wide disaster that throws us back to pre-industrial times, we will have a complete understanding of human genetics and embryology and the means to tweak and change them at will. One among many things that knowledge could be applied to would be tailoring genders to any desired configuration, an obviously extremely sensitive subject. Some people would see this as a way to finally make all newborns firmly cisgendered as God intended. Others might see it as a way to make them able to enjoy the full spectrum of sexual activities and everything in between. What do you think should be done with that knowledge and probably far more relevant, what do you think will actually be done with it? Well, as far as what should be done with it, I am uh, fairly reluctant to endorse genetic engineering in this way. I, I think that genetically tailoring people is uh, a very dangerous road to start down unless we limit it to just correcting birth defects, you know, things that, that would shorten lifespan or g greatly reduce quality of life for a person, like in, a, in an unavoidable way. Um, other than something like that, I think it would be bad, like especially w with gender and sexuality, I think it would be m far preferable for society to fix itself and for, for our society to fix our fucked up uh, and discriminatory and intolerant and closed-minded attitudes toward gender and sexuality than it would be to try to fix people, you know, in vitro with, with genetic resequencing so that they come out as quote-unquote the right gender or the right body or whatever. Um, I just think that's, I, I, I feel like we would really fuck that up. That just seems like something we would really fuck up if we use that technology for that purpose. Um, but as for what will be done with it, uh, I think once that technology exists, at least here in the United States, I don't foresee a lot being done with it, at least in my lifetime. I think people will be fairly paralyzed by it. I mean, look at the amount of resistance that still exists to this day for something like stem cell research, uh, embryonic stem cell research, which is not nearly as fraught with the ethical perils that uh, the, the process you're describing would be. And yet there's such incredible political resistance to it that it has been stymied and held back for decades. So if that is the case with something like embryonic stem cell research, which has the potential to yield just unthinkably positive results, um, I think something like genetic resequencing, especially if we're saying let's employ it to affect people's gender identities or, or people's sexuality, um, I think that that's just something that isn't going to get off the ground. I don't think it's going to be very widely used uh, in this country. Maybe other places in the world will take advantage of it. Uh, but I don't see the United States, uh, a place as mostly scientifically conservative as the United States has been for the last several decades, um, embracing that and, and having that technology be widely used. Maybe I'm completely wrong about that, but that's just the feeling I get. Dr. Babylon, Steve, I've come to support a living wage, and I'm perplexed why this isn't already the default for most politicians. From my perspective, a living wage doesn't even sound like a leftist position. It sounds like a way to deal with the issue of poverty without rewarding people too lazy to find jobs or conditioning people to rely on the government for handouts. What are your thoughts on this? Oh, I agree completely. I think the national minimum wage should be a living wage. And I think there should be a mechanism in the law that ties it to inflation so that there's an automatic increase. Whenever the buying power of the dollar shrinks, uh, the dollar amount of the minimum wage should go up so it, it remains a living wage from year to year. I, I agree with you. I don't see why people 
who, especially people who work full time, um, should be for, should be forced to accept a situation where they can work a full time job um, or, or multiple part time jobs. They can end up working 40, 50, 60 hours a week sometimes and still not be able to get by, you know, not they still have to struggle to pay their bills or not be able to afford medical care for them or their kids or, or, or any, I mean, it just, it makes no sense at all. It is not beneficial to our society. It's not beneficial certainly to those individuals. And for the life of me, I can't figure out why especially working class people don't support it wholeheartedly and nearly unanimously. History has shown that raising the minimum wage does not tank the economy. There's no reason to believe that raising the minimum wage will cause large numbers of people to lose their jobs or, or will halt economic growth or any of these other uh, doomsday stories that people who are against raising the minimum wage to a level of a living wage often often say. There's, there's no reason not to do it. And yeah, I, if you are someone who is against social welfare programs, and I personally am not, but if you are someone who is against those people getting those government handouts, why wouldn't you support a living wage? Then people who work can pay their own way from their wages that they earn, and they won't have to rely on social safety net programs. Yeah, I, it baffles me why anybody other than invested, moneyed business interests who just don't want to pay people more, who just want to keep their money for themselves, uh, other than those assholes, it boggles my mind how anybody can be against it. Scott Bressinger, I'm sure you're familiar with the Bechdel test as it applies to film, so much so that I don't even have to describe it. I've applied it to some of my favorite movies and filmmakers and was disheartened by how poorly they did. Stanley Kubrick, in particular, seems to have had little to no interest in female characters. There's a feminist interpretation of The Shining that I like, though. David Lynch comes out surprisingly strong. The Hurt Locker, which earned director Catherine Bigelow an Oscar, is a massive fail. Understandable given the subject matter, though. How do some of your favorite films and directors fare under the Bechdel test? Do you keep it in mind when watching new movies? If you've seen it, do you think Wonder Woman passes? Thanks. And Nolite Te Bastardes Carborodorum. Yeah, thank you for that. Car Carborodorum. <laughs> A little uh, shout out to the uh, the Handmaid's Tale, which definitely does pass the Bechdel test. So I, I like that. Um, I don't I don't keep it in mind consciously when I'm watching movies in general. Uh, most of my favorite films don't pass the test. Um, but that's kind of the point of the test. The point of the Bechdel test isn't to evaluate individual movies so that you watch, say, The Shining and it doesn't pass the Bechdel test. So you say, oh, that, therefore that is a sexist movie. Uh, the Bechdel test isn't designed to test individual movies for sexism. It's designed to reveal the overall sexism of the motion picture and industry, the overall male, pro-male bias of the motion picture industry because you will notice if you start looking at movies in terms of the Bechdel test, how few movies pass it. And for those of you who don't know what the Bechdel test is, the Bechdel test, uh, in order to pass the Bechdel test, a movie must have at least two female characters who are named, who have a conversation with each other, and the conversation has to be about something other than a man. If those three things do not occur, then the movie does not pass the Bechdel test. Um, and yeah, the, uh, there are lots of movies that pass it, and the more time goes by, uh, the, more, the higher the percentage gets of movies that are released that pass the test. But overall, it's still a, 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 uh, a minority of movies that, that are released that pass the Bechdel test, and that's the point. The point of the test is to reveal um, the overall sexism, not the sexism of individual movies. So I don't really think of it in terms, when, when I watch like, because you're, you're right, Stanley Kubrick movies are, are terrible with the Bechdel test. Most of my favorite filmmakers are terrible with the Bechdel test. Um, but that's the point of the test, to reveal that, that overall general sexism. Uh, so no, I don't think about it in terms of individual movies, uh, when I'm, just when I'm sitting down to watch a movie. Um, and no, I have not seen Wonder Woman yet, so I don't know if it passes the Bechdel test or not. Jennifer Havard, speaking of Trump, have you heard that the U.S. government may shut down in September over funding for Trump's fucking border wall? 
Part of it may be funded by the Department of Homeland Security, even though everyone knows it's a shitty idea based on an even shittier premise, racism and xenophobia, of course. Plus, they plan to bulldoze a bird sanctuary in Texas in the process. Three emphatic thumbs down. Can you get carpal tunnel from flipping this guy off too much? Uh, I hope not, because I flip him off twice every other week at the end of the Facepalm 5. Um, yeah, I, you know, if there's any justice in the world, either that wall will never be built, and I'm kind of ba banking on that, um, or if it is built, some uh, heroic Democratic senator or congressman will propose a law that will require Trump's presidential library to be built into the wall because I could think of no better, more fitting monument to the Trump presidency than a, 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 an, an overexpensive uh, uh, eyesore that makes, uh, that, that does incredible damage to the natural environment and doesn't even accomplish its stated goal. An expensive, ugly, useless monstrosity that did great damage on its way up. That to me is, I mean, you couldn't have a better metaphor for Donald Trump than that, if indeed they do build that wall. So hopefully they won't. But if they do, it will be Trump's lasting legacy in this country. And you couldn't have a more fitting legacy for a man like Trump than that fucking border wall. Harry Ray, probably the biggest racial justice fights here in Australia are centered on First Nations people and the continuing effects of colonization. To what extent do you think such issues are overlooked in the U.S. because the effects of white supremacy on African American and Latinx are perhaps more obvious? It seems to me that it's hard to build a racially just society on land and with resources that were stolen and never ceded. Thoughts? Yeah, absolutely. The, the, to me, the best example of state white supremacy in the United States, uh, and it sounds like in Australia as well from your question, is the treatment of Native Americans, the treatment of our indigenous people here in the United States, because they are so ground under and dominated by white supremacy that we don't even talk about them anymore. Unless something like uh, the Dakota Access Pipeline comes up and we see, once again, we are reminded of how little the input of Native American peoples is uh, solicited or valued. We built this country on land belonging to those people, belonging to those tribes. And they didn't give it to us, and we didn't ask for it. We just took it. And that's something that will be a stain on this country forever. And what makes it worse is that we don't care. Like, we, we, we see no reason to, to be upset about it. We see no reason to try to make good on it. Even today, we see no reason to respect the rights of Native peoples. If we want to build a pipeline through their reservation, and they don't want us to, guess who's building a pipeline? Like we, we, we completely disregard their rights and their concerns whenever it suits us, and it's appalling. So yeah, you're right. It's, it's, um, it, it's, it is impossible to truly build a racially just society uh, on that foundation. And, and the way we treat native peoples in the United States is absolutely un unforgivable and inexcusable. And on that happy note, it's time for the next part of this video, which hopefully will at least be excusable and forgivable. And that's a little something I like to call the lightning round. Dear Wunderbar Bar, what's your favorite instrumental song? For me, it's Maggot Brain by Funkadelics, a 10 minute guitar solo performed by Eddie Hazel, the lead guitarist at that point, 1971. Uh, my favorite instrumental song, Rock House by Ray Charles. Love that one. Jay Dodify, I'm starting to get excited about Star Trek Discovery. Are you? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I thought the new trailer was awesome. I, I get excited about everything new that comes out of Star Trek. So I'm a, I'm a, I'm a Star Trek mark. But yes, I am, I am very excited about it and very much looking forward to it. Joshua Purvis, hi, Steve. My question is, who are some of your favorite WCW wrestlers and WWE wrestlers? Thanks, Steve, for answering my question. Well, thank you for asking them, Joshua. Um, favorite WCW wrestlers? Uh, I really liked Booker T. I loved going back, not just to WCW, but past that in, into the Jim Crockett promotions era in the 80s. Um, I loved the Midnight Express. I loved the Rock and Roll Express. I loved Dusty Rhodes and the Four Horsemen. Um, yeah. I don't know. I, I there's a lot of there's a lot of guys from WCW slash Jim Crockett promotions in the uh, in the the 80s and early 90s that I loved. Sting, 
you know, how you gonna, how can you not say Sting? Um, WWE, Kurt Angle, Chris Jericho, uh, Brian Daniels, Daniel Bryan, CM Punk, um, Cesaro. I love Cesaro. Um, yeah, I don't know. It goes on and on and on, doesn't it? There's there's so many names I could name. That oh, Dean Ambrose. Come on. Uh, Vitamin W. On the most recent, and Steve Austin, how could I not say Steve Austin? Steve Austin, one of my very favorites, and The Rock, but I'm more of an Austin guy than a Rock guy. Anyway, Vitamin W, on the most recent and Atheist Reads, there was the idea of more peaceful but less textually accurate versions of religion. What's worse, following a religion literally because that's what the Holy Book says, or more modernistic but cognitive dissonance inducing more liberal religion? Also, what's the plural of Batman? Batmans? Batmen? Batsman? Men bet? Example, is Batfleck in your top five batsmen? Think attorneys general or passers-by. Um, well, the more peaceful versions are preferable, even if they do induce cognitive dissonance, because cognitive dissonance in the service of a more peaceful and tolerant world is no vice. And the plural to me would be Batmans. I think that is the, the acceptable plural of Batman. But please, feel free to fight about it in the comment section. Secular Scholar, hey Steve. A thought I had recently was that the stories of Jesus appearing after the crucifixion might have been an early example of the Mandela effect when they wrote their accounts years later. That's a really good observation. I think that might be true. People maybe sincerely remembered that they saw that they were in a crowd and they saw Jesus appearing. Or maybe they remembered hearing about a big crowd gathered where Jesus appeared after the, the crucifixion. I, I think that might be at least a partial explanation for some of it, sure. I mean, I don't think that all of it was due to people just flat out lying and making stuff up on purpose, although there was probably some of that too. I mean, I do think a lot of people were just honestly mistaken or deluded or carried off by, you know, uh, the, the myth and the legend of it. So yeah, I think, I think maybe there might have been some Mandela effect going on back in the day. Matt Machado. Hey Steve, I was wondering what you thought about William Shatner's recent anti-SJW screed on Twitter where he parroted the usual anti-SJW talking points. Were you disappointed or did it not surprise you? A little bit of both. I, it did disappoint me because I love William Shatner and his work, especially in Star Trek, has, has meant a great deal to me in my life. Um, but it didn't surprise me. He, he's an 86-year-old rich white guy. I mean, you have to sort of tailor your expectations. You know, he's lived a life of a certain amount of privilege, especially over the last 30 years or so, you know, after Star Trek really took off and became a cultural mainstay and he was out of his lean years as an actor that he had to live through in the 70s. Um, I, yeah, I, uh, it doesn't surprise me. It disappoints me, but it doesn't surprise me. Uh, Chris Abbey, why are there no male ginger porn stars? Are we not human? When you prick us, is that true? Are there really no major male ginger porn stars? I, I, I didn't know. Well, if that's true, I mean, it sounds like there's a void to be filled there. Lucas Hackett, sorry if I've been late, but what kind of coffee do you prefer? Folgers or Maxwell House? And what is the best tasting creamer there is? Um, I don't know, maybe Chris Abbey would know about best tasting creamer. Um, I prefer Maxwell House of those two, and I drink my coffee black, so I don't know and I don't care about what the best creamer is, <laughs> so I can't help you there. Uh, William Randolph Hearst, wow, that's famous, famous dead people commenting on my videos. William Randolph Hearst, hey Steve, which of these types of apologists would be the most annoying to debate? A, an anti-feminist rape apologist, B, a presuppositionalist Christian apologist, C, a Batman v Superman apologist. Well, I, I would I don't debate rape apologists, so A is off the list right away. I just I wouldn't debate that person at all. Uh, B a presuppositional Christian apologist. I mean, that would be more fun at this point because I'm wise to the act, and it would be more interesting to you. You can't have a real debate with such a person, so it would be fun to just sort of toy with them and try to throw them off of their script. That's really the best you can do. So really, the only honest debate. <laughs> debate uh, that could be had would be with a Batman v Superman apologist and yeah that would be incredibly annoying because it's annoying that anybody likes that movie and, and feels like they can defend it at all so I would have to go with C. C would be the most annoying. Uh, Joe McClory if you had the choice of deleting and banning Trump 
from having a verified Twitter account or being able to do the same with everyone whose media fame was limited to social media sites, YouTube included, and violated Twitter's terms of service, which would you do? Uh, I'd do the second one. I'd get rid of everybody. I'd get rid of all the other bullies and harassers uh, besides Trump. I mean, as personally fulfilling as it might be to see Trump <laughs> lose his Twitter account and as entertaining as it would be to see him forced to like go on TV and radio shows to complain about losing his Twitter because he would have nowhere else to piss and moan about it, um, I think it would be better for the people using Twitter if we got rid of all the rest of the abusers instead of just getting rid of one high profile abuser, I think I would do that because I think that would improve Twitter for the most people. Um, but yeah, it, it would be tempting to say, ah, to just kick Trump off. It, it, would, be, it would be entertaining to watch the aftermath of that. Uh, but you know, I would do the second one. Hey, that's the last question. It's time now for the shout out. The shout out this week goes to an organization that is dedicated to helping refugees escape from North Korea and then resettle in the United States or other places where they can live a, a freer, more peaceful, hopefully more stable life. The organization that I am recommending to you for this week's shout out is called Liberty in North Korea, also known as LINK, L-I-N-K. It is a fantastic organization that works not only to help people who want to leave North Korea get the hell out of there, which is a task unto itself, as you can imagine, but also supporting North Korean refugees, helping them start new lives with all of the terrible, just incredibly anxiety-inducing news uh, in, in, in the news the last few days regarding North Korea's nuclear program and our dipshit president doing everything he possibly can to inflame and escalate that situation. Um, there's a lot of anxiety, a lot of nervousness, and a lot of worry about conflict with North Korea. And I feel like in that time, we should worry not only about ourselves, but also about the people of North Korea who are suffering more than most of us can imagine and have been for decades. And if there is any way to help people in North Korea who want to get out of there, I think we should, uh, we should throw our support behind people who are trying to do that. Such people are those who are involved with liberty in North Korea. So that is my shout out. Check it out if it seems like you're a cup of tea and you want to support it. I would highly encourage you to do so. You can go to libertyinnorthkorea.org to learn more about this organization and their work. And I, I very much urge you to do so. That's the shout out. I also want to remind you, as I always do, to check out the Lemmy Listen family of podcasts. These are podcasts that are created and co-hosted for the most part by my very good friend Jason Harding, the puppet master of Opinionville. I want to call your attention specifically to the Late Seating Podcast, which is a podcast that Jason co-hosts with me, which is the main reason why I'm mentioning it, because I think it's awesome and I'm in it. And this is a belated movie review podcast where we take a fresh look at movies that have a reputation for either being great or for being terrible and we we give the movie a fresh look we run through a synopsis and make fun of it for your entertainment and for ours and then we decide whether the movie deserves its reputation whether that reputation is good or bad and if you listen to our most recent episode you can hear our review of the classic 1968 sci-fi fantasy adventure film planet of the apes and you can do a little bit of homework for next week's new episode, which will go up next Friday, which will be our review of the classic sexploitation movie, Faster Pussycat Kill Kill. So if you want to get all the jokes for next week's episode, go watch Faster Pussycat Kill Kill sometime between now and then. And after you've done that, in the meantime, if you're still starved for entertainment, you can listen to the most recent episode of Late Seating and all of the past episodes of Late Seating and all of the episodes of all of the awesome Lemmy Listen podcasts by going to lemmylistenpodcast.com. And I highly recommend that you do so, my friend. I highly recommend that you do so. That's it for me, everybody. I am out of here for another week. I want to remind you, as always, to please leave a comment on this video asking me your question for next time. You can ask me anything about anything. Nothing is too serious, nothing is too silly. I will answer as many of your questions as I possibly can in the next video, but for that to happen, you have to ask. So please do leave a comment in the comment section of this video to ask me your question for the next You Had to Ask video. I look forward to reading your questions. Thank you all so very much for watching, and I'll see you next time. Take care, everybody. Hey folks, one more thing before I go. I hope you found this video worth watching. If you did, please like and share and subscribe to this channel if you have not done so already. And also, please, please, please consider helping me to make more videos like this one by supporting this channel through Patreon. 
you can go to patreon.com slash steve shives and become a patron of this channel for as little as one dollar a month which helps me out more than i can tell you those one dollar a month pledges they really add up and if you can afford to go a little more say five dollars a month or ten dollars a month or even twenty dollars a month there are some very special perks you can take advantage of built into the campaign for higher pledges so please consider helping me out through the patreon campaign thank you all so very much for watching and for your support in whatever form it takes and i'll see you next time